All right, so um, to wrap up the program this year, we decided to try something different, right? You don't want to get uh, stuck in your comfort zone. Um, so we decided to try some live TV. Um, so we're going to do a panel discussion. Um, and I'll be moderating, and the rest of you can jump in and speak. So, um, so Saturn, this is number 15. Uh, it started in 2005. Um, if you go back, that was just eight years after um, Mary Garland and David Shaw published a book. It was called Software Architecture, Perspectives on an Emerging Discipline. That was really the thing that, that launched software architecture. Um, eight years later, it had kind of become big enough that the SEI could bring together 48 people in the basement and uh, have some discussions about it. Um, and you know, since then, in the last 15 years, the field has really grown. Uh, practices have matured. Um, we have the, our panelists today. Uh, we'll do a little bit of looking back, but uh, try to spend most of our time looking forward. Uh, what are the challenges of today and the future? And maybe can the lessons of the past help us address some of those? Uh, so the panel, we have uh, Felix Bachman, uh, has been at the SEI for more than 20 years, working in software architecture research, supporting large organizations to help them uh, do better software engineering uh, in large systems and predictably exhibit the properties that their users are looking for. Uh, Timon. Uh, is a software engineer and enterprise architect uh, making the Swedish local government debt office deliver software faster. Um, he claims to be the youngest one on the panel, uh, and so I guess he's our future. Um, uh, Tracy Bannon is a uh, chief architect with Deloitte Consulting, uh, focusing on government clients, spending most of her time recently with defense clients, working through fog computing patterns. Uh, how do we get from cloud to edge? And on the past year, I've been working on the leadership team for Deloitte to reinvent, reinvigorate, and revise their next generation architect program to mentor and mature their practices across uh, the spectrum of architecture types. Um, Adam. Adam Wynn, uh, technical lead architect, uh, technical lead and architect at Bosch in, here in Pittsburgh, focusing on IoT applications running in the cloud and the edge. Um, prior to joining Bosch, he worked in R&D for a Department of Energy National Lab, building distributed applications for scientific and national security domains. And uh, finally, Paolo Merson, a uh, software developer, 30 years of experience, still loves to code, um, and enjoys sharing his experience with peer developers in talks, classes, and on Stack Overflow. All right, so. So Saturn One was in 2005. Um, what were you doing in 2005, Adam? Actually, uh, interesting thing is that that's the year I got my first architecture gig. Okay, just starting. <laughs> Felix, 2005. 2005, that was the time where we had fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, as, as you said, architecture was just in the, you know, getting established. Yep. There were a lot of questions open. You know, not how the big picture looks like, but how exactly does that work? Yeah. 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 Okay. So that was a time where we created the reasoning frameworks. Someone, may, if you have the hard color like me, then you probably remember this. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, so, well, actually, you know, there was a lot of discovery there, yeah, and a lot of fun. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Tracy, 2005, where were you? I was in elementary school. Exactly. Ah, <laughs> good answer. Okay. <laughs> um, in all honesty, I think 2005, I was working on a bridge inspection system, designing a bridge inspection system. Mm -hmm. I had gotten a lot of support from above from someone who was mentoring me and said, yep, we need a woman architect, and you seem to understand what you're doing, um, and supported me, and that was kind of the genesis towards uh, what I'm doing today. Great. Paul? So I was at the, that first workshop, first Saturn edition. You were? Yes. Okay. And I remember it was probably the most exciting thing that we got to do at the basement at the SDI. <laughs> <laughs> and we were uh, discussing architecture, yeah. learning, a lot of things, so that was a very interesting time. Yeah. Yeah. Timon, 2005, level set us. Where he really you? was in elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking I would study aerospace engineering. Okay. But uh, the year after, I became an undergraduate in computer science. Okay, great, great. So, um, uh, 
so if we go back to 2005, um, Felix, you said we were, we were just getting started. So what was the, the big problem that needed to get solved? Yeah, the big problem really was trying to understand what that architecture thing actually is. What do you actually do when you do architecture? Mm -hmm. yeah. So at, at the SEI, we tried to get a little bit more away from the, you know, the gut feel. Yeah. Oh, it looks good, or it sounds good, or how about you know, we try this? And a little bit more towards understanding that, yeah, well, if you have this type of problem, here is what you can do for it. And of course, have the reasoning why it actually will work mm. yeah, if you do it. And Paolo, so you were there 2005. What were people talking about? What was the, the challenge? So Felix mentioned the work with reasoning frameworks. There was mm -hmm. a, uh, that was interesting because we were trying to uh, go deep in quality attribute discussions, creating uh, designs and techniques that could help us to better achieve these qualities. Yeah. Um, and I think overall industry at that point uh, was more concerned with architecture than it, it is today. Mm. Hmm. Right. So, in a different right. way. In a different way. Things yeah. changed. Yeah, right. and I, the focus of architecture, I, I think, has changed. Uh, there's a, <coughs> had a, a really good debate with someone the other day about this um, because of the proliferation of the folks who have the title architect or have it beside their name. Um, and it's coming with certificates that they're getting because they're going out and they're taking, especially in the cloud area, they're, going, they're, now, they're now solution architects. Okay, great, what does that mean? I recently, um, some people were given to me to leverage them on a project and four of them I had to roll off um, because I said, well, great, you're solution architects. You, these are the things that you should understand. Um, and they didn't because Reference architectures, God love the, the industry, but they're publishing reference architectures, but people don't understand. How do I make a decision? That one looks good. Oh, it says That's it's right. for this reason, so I'll use that one because it, mm -hmm. it looks good, and it's got the right icon set that my client's using, so they're AWS, <laughs> so I'm gonna use that icon set, and so they go down that path. Yeah. So what I fear is that architecture is still alive, but in a, it's, it's kind of getting a sticker on everybody right now. It, I think mm -hmm. it's getting, I don't want to say polluted, but I don't think it has the same um, value um, in a name recognition that it did. Yeah. So Adam, you started in 2005, you're still doing it. What's changed? Well, I mean, so the, the, the interesting thing was the, one of the first, the first project I was working on was, um, it was a, a research initiative uh, called uh, data intensive computing, and so oh. this was kind of the predecessor to the, the big data movement. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing was the problem wasn't the fact that they had big data. The fact that the problem was they had all these different components, existing components, new components they wanted to, to build, and they wanted to stick them all together like Legos and um, build real applications out of them. So yeah. I mean, for me, um, you know. The, the integration was, was, was really the, the, the first problem that I saw, and it's actually something I see continuing okay. throughout the work that I've done. I, I, see, I see these integration problems and, and, and topics coming up constantly. So it doesn't go away. Timon, so does it, any of this sound like what you're seeing? Yeah, it's familiar. I mean, I'd like to build on, on the discussion Tracy and Paolo had here, because I also feel that Arch has got sort of a bad rap during the Agile age. Uh, uh, LTO spoke about the, the angry Agile gods, <laughs> uh, which I think was very <laughs> apt. I, th I think that it has limited us in, in bringing ideas uh, into wider practice. Um, the example of decision making, right? I re recall discussing with Linda, I think at ICSI last year in, in Sweden, like, okay, why isn't architecture decision making established yet? Right? I mean, in, in the people here, that is, yeah, of course. Yeah. But outside the architects that Tracy just mentioned, they don't think of architecture as decision making. Well, okay. that actually became a huge deal for us. So, and for my, if I, I work with Deloitte, and it became a big deal be, because of that. So, you'd have somebody who's, we're hiring, we're bringing them in, we're working with them in another firm, we're partnering with them, and we're not able to qualify or quantify what their capabilities or competencies are. Mm -hmm. The number one thing, regardless as to the technology stack for me, is can they make a decision and can they document or articulate how they got to that decision? Yeah. Um, so whether it's tool-based, you know, I don't, I don't care, but if you can't tell me how did you, how did you get there um, predictably, yeah. 
As a matter of fact, uh, the organization I work for, I see uh, a lot of teams making important design decisions, including technology choices. And uh, the reason is everybody else seems to be doing that, going in that direction. So uh, as uh, Eljo mentioned just uh, a few minutes ago, I find myself uh, oftentimes asking the question, why? What does this give us? And I actually stimulate people to always ask why before any important decisions. That's mm -hmm. lacking, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about the balance, you know, looking back and looking forward? Uh, technical competence versus competence in other areas, right? Francis and uh, Jürgen this morning talked about the, the radar diagram for the, the Siemens uh, health and ears architects, right? Um, did that, does that make sense for us or um, do we need to focus on more on technical, more on soft skills, other things? Well, Felix? If, if I can jump in here, same, again, comparing with you know, what we saw the architect's work was 20 years ago you know, mm -hmm. versus what they do today. And more and more I see a, a shift here. 20 years ago, I mean, we always said, and I'm pretty sure during the first Saturn that we had and almost every Saturn that we had, we always made the point in saying, beside of the technical knowledge, yeah, the architect's job is also to be a communicator. It has to convince people. We always made that. It didn't change go away. But today, more and more, I see that the need for having a deep technical understanding, especially in that world where we have the proliferation yeah, of technologies around. You know? Just take the pictures that Angie just, just presented here. You know? <laughs> yeah. it, it seems to be impossible that any single architect can have all the deep understanding of all the technologies that are possible there and what can they do for it. So it changes more towards what I still have to understand what the properties of these are. Yeah, so what, what do I gain when mm -hmm. I use a certain technology? And of course, what do I have to pay for you know, when I use it? But there's a, there's yep. a transferability, but, though, to what you're talking about. Like we used to say, went from a language, I could go from a language to a language, so give me a Java programmer and I can turn them on to C Sharp and things would be fine because they can apply those same skills. From a, an architectural trade-off analysis perspective, I should be able to look at a technology that I don't understand. And I, and I do, this yep. happens to me day in and day out. I have to go in and, and evaluate something I have no clue about, but my, the ability to evaluate and ask the questions, right? Because the core concepts, right? The illities and being able to poke holes, you know, or to say that, that doesn't quite make sense um, is, is an important, is an important right. part I of it. I completely mm -hmm. agree. Yeah, and therefore, it's more the shift towards, you need to understand what the properties are, but now your job as the architect is to communicate this, mm -hmm. to convince people, yeah, saying, no, you don't use that technology just because it's cool today. Yeah, you use it because it does solve a problem mm -hmm. or does, does solve your problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So getting teams together, yeah, and not just technical teams, yeah, but all the organization, the decision makers, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, being able to present, present to them. <laughs> that I see as a pretty big shift so in the past, you may have said, well, 50-50. 50% communication, 50% you know, technical understanding. Right. Today, I would say it's more like 80-20. Really? Yeah. So 80 communication, 20% technology. I mean, I, I, so actually, I really I, agree with that because, yeah. I mean, I think, I think we can always, you can always go to the developers and say why, and you can work with them to understand why, but then where you really show your value to the whole to the whole company is when you then can organize these ideas and these concepts, yep. actually organize the different technical yeah, groups I that are agree. contributing to this and saying, this is what we think, and this yeah. is yep. where you drive, drive the value. And yeah. do you oh. keep, yeah, I was gonna ask, uh, how do you keep credibility with the developers, though, if you're not speaking that deeply technical language with all of the latest, you know, Amazon? Well, actually, you need I don't, to. I don't, you, need, yeah. you need to, to an extent. I may not code as fast as my developers anymore, and I'm not saying that I don't, <laughs> but at least I'm not, I'm not a relic, and so I, I am doing things. Um, if yeah. it's not on the, you know, prepping to take something to production, if I don't own a user story 
That doesn't mean that I haven't touched the code recently or haven't opened it up. Yeah. I constantly surprise my team and maybe make them angry. <laughs> then I'm out there and I'm opening stuff up and I have folks beneath me who are doing code reviews, but I go out there and spot check too. Yeah. And when you get an email from me and you're a more junior guy, wow, yeah. she actually is still mm -hmm. looking at this stuff. So there are small things that you can do. Okay. Mm -hmm. I expect them to run faster. Mm -hmm. That's okay. They can mm -hmm. run faster, right? Mm -hmm. And people yeah. understand also that you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be depth, deep in every single topic they're deep in. Exactly. Okay. But as long as you show them that, that you have some competence in some area, they mm -hmm. say, oh, this person has chops. So yeah. Yeah. I respect them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, Time, and what are you, what are you saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was sort of agreeing with everything being said. And I think that the, sort of the deep technical understanding is one of the things that makes that I can be effective as an architect despite my juniority or mm -hmm. meteority. Okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, I have a, a, a broad, uh, but I think uh, I'm blessed with a very high quality uh, undergraduate and graduate mm -hmm. uh, studies in computer science. So I studied operating systems with Andy Tannenbaum, right? I studied okay. distributed systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, all these concepts mm -hmm. are not foreign to me. So taking mm -hmm. on a new technology into your rucksack is really a rather easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you need this social skill set. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I would, I would add, add to it. What you just said, you know, what you actually do is, you, know, you use the education that you have, your knowledge that you have, and of course, yes, you know, at some point in time, it is uh, based in some deep understanding of something, but you don't have the deep understanding across. But you know, many of the technologies you know, use similar concept. If you abstract that up away a little bit, you know, um, in mind today when you, you know, talk about microservices. You know, well, 20 years ago, we didn't have microservices. You know? But a basic problem that is solved with microservices that was already there you know, 20 years ago. Coupling you know, and, yeah, and, and there were already solutions for it. Mm -hmm. you know? So, yes, you use that understanding, you know, and you can actually you know, get jobs with the developers you know, when you just use them and say, okay, microservices. I don't understand anything about microservices. You know? But I do know, you know that there is a data synchronization problem. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. You just ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't get an answer, yeah, then you get that, wow, I didn't think about it. So okay. maybe we still understand something you know, <laughs> about it. Yeah. So you can get yeah. credibility, yeah, yeah. even if you don't really know all the details you know, of that specific technology there. Yeah. So, so looking at the problems that we need to solve, um, what do we need today? Is it tools and methods? Is it just more knowledge and brain power? Is it uh, things from the past that we need to pull forward? Maybe something we forgot? Paolo, what do you think? For the work with architecture, well, I'm, I'm gonna use that question to agree more on Adam's point that yeah. uh, we, we need uh, sound technology uh, knowledge at this point. Knowledge, okay. Uh, but we need to understand the principle. So when, when I teach microservices, um, often I show them a slide, and I, I don't go 20 years back, I go almost 50 years back, I show them, oh, look, uh, these are kind of the basic principles behind the mm -hmm. microservice architecture style, but mm -hmm. look at this, and then I pull up a Dave Parnas article from 72, yep. and I got some excerpts there that map directly to the point. So, yes. I mean, what is a microservice today? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, understanding the technology of implementation is important. Uh, maybe not because you, you need to, to put it in practice, but because you, you need to be credible. Mm -hmm. And that is a big challenge yeah. for okay. the architects. And it's just a fact that you need to be credible. Yeah. But uh, you need to understand the principles. So, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's a communication challenge, okay. uh, more than a tool or a uh, technology right. challenge. But by the way, this is what's so awesome about the SEI because, you know, without kind of efforts like this, we, we might not be able to remind people that, that these microservices um, are completely new. You know, this is, they also <laughs> map back to something yes. that you've actually all learned in your computer science degrees, no matter when you got your computer science degree. This is yes. something, these are in, I mean, that's why think those the, the microservices course I like the fact so. that our young developers are so excited by the command line personally right oh yeah yeah, yeah right <laughs> yeah it was, uh, it was rediscovering Conway's law which is even earlier right 1968 
Yeah. Um, suddenly mm -hmm. that's getting lots of press, mm -hmm. right? So, so Felix and I got the big chest because we are the oldest here. Yeah. And, and just uh, old? <laughs> <laughs> don't fool yourself. Uh, so, but uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, I, I was uh, in Sao Paulo working with, with some development in a uh, big company, but full of people in their 20s. Mm -hmm. and, and we were doing uh, mob programming, and there were four people uh, taking turns at the keyboard. This is like pair programming with oh, more than two. Mob, yes. uh, <clears throat> and it's uh, crazy fast because you alternate and so on. Né? And I was uh, like uh, twice as old as, as, as them. And uh, I was actually, initially, I didn't think that was, I was going to play, but they, they got me playing. So, um, and they were doing things in Java. And then we took a break for lunch, and we walk out, and, and someone asked, so uh, since when have you been working with Java? And I told them, oh, no, I, I, I became a Java certified programmer in, in 2000. And it, oh, <laughs> man. Uh, that, so what version of Java was that? Like four? I said, no, there was Java 2. And, oh my <laughs> God, I can't believe this. And, yeah. and I'm the Did old guy the there. And, and then they, yeah. so, no, here's the thing. And then they, I mean, they look at you, you're very old. You can still code. Yeah. And then I said to them, and I don't think you should be using Java anymore. This is the old way. I use Kotlin. And I said, oh. yeah. So I got more <laughs> credible all yeah, okay. the way, all, all of a sudden, just because of that. Yeah. So th this is a challenge uh, right. uh, for us to keep up, up to date Knowledge. with all the new things going on. Yeah. So if you keep the right, uh, the, the good thing is with experience, with a good uh, background, solid background mm -hmm. in understanding architectural pin principles, design principles, yeah. you can more easily uh, uh, in the landscape identify what is important, what is just fluff, right, and uh, go around. So, so we, we don't need more tools is what you're saying. No, no right? more. I think we have enough tools and I don't need any more yeah, methodologies. Line does it. Okay. But one thing we haven't, we haven't touched on yet yeah. is that it feels like we're talking about this group of people. Right. Um, and one of my bigger concerns is the next generation. It doesn't have to be yeah. 20 years junior. I just mean the guy who's a couple of steps behind me. So am I making the opportunities, mentoring him and bringing him up alongside me so that he sees how I'm making those decisions might not be my development team. It might be someone that I pluck out and say, he seems to have good insights, good instinct. Are you bringing them alongside so that you are going to have that? And then there's, a, there's also a conduit that comes with that as well because there's that bridging that gap because you're bringing somebody mm -hmm. yeah. up alongside you. So you learn from them as well, yeah. right? Yeah. So timing, is there somebody that you're following? Uh, or are the you the- runs. <laughs> well, day-to-day, uh, uh, -day? No. I mean, is no, in your organization? No, I'm, I'm the, the, the only the... architect on payroll. I, I have followers oh, wow. instead. Uh, so uh, I have the same challenges that, that Tracy describes, actually. Oh. Uh, trying to explain people how to use ADRs and okay. what an architecture decision is. So why we should a do team? an ATEM. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and Adam, you were... I, d I did want to say something about methodology, though, because um, maybe we don't need more, but and I don't know how to get here, but I feel like methodologies need to be more somehow prescriptive because I, I, feel, hmm. I feel like we come up with these great ideas, we've organized, we see what people are doing, we say, yes, the, here's the general patterns of how it gets done, but there's, if, if you say, ah, yeah, I get that, but then there's still so much hard work to do to make that particular methodology work for you. And so, I don't know how to get there, but. Why don't so do we need great? a manifesto? Right, I mean, you take the Agile Manifesto and then you know you could start the angry Agilists, right? So no, we can have the angry architects. I think, I think, it's, I think it's so much easier than all of that. Um, and okay. this is where rose-colored glasses come on. Um, so I was co-located with folks that I call process weenies and, and they were putting together and uh, they were doing all of our CMMI um, accreditation and I got to really watch how we were talking about process and how we were putting together methodologies and how we were knitting things together and how we were dictating. Um, and what I learned from that entire process is that methodology is awesome. It does wonders for you. Um, mm -hmm. But consistency can also be the hobgoblin of the small-minded. So there's a pragmatism that has to happen. Mm -hmm. So when we're sitting down and planning out a project, I don't necessarily execute project one the same way that I'm executing project two because I have to look at the constructs. Mm -hmm. I have to look at what we're trying to accomplish. I have to look at the skills that are there. And then I tailor it or the people I'm working with and we tailor it. Now, the piece that I think where you're really coming from is we need rigor. So 
So there are so many methodologies, there's so many ways to do it. It's how do you commit to doing what you said that you're going to do, right? Back to the squaw, back in the day when you had CMMI and you have the software yeah. quality um, uh, assurance and you were saying, I'm, I plan to do this and somebody comes in and looks and says, well, did you do what you said that you were gonna do? Mm. I think with methodology right now, we have to articulate why we're going to yeah. do it and then we have to you know, mm. kind of ad adopt a rigor to make it happen. Mm. Yeah. Do you do any measurement of your architecture or architecture artifacts? Anyone? So um, I think for everybody, the simplest thing that anyone can do is tech, technical depth measure. Okay. And you can automate some of that. It's not perfect, but so what, that's what we do in our organization. We are yeah. lightweight with respect to process. So, uh, but we, we do, we try to, to do a lot of code analysis. The automation is, is the big neighbor okay. in that case. So we can point out issues at the somewhat at the architectural level. I hear there's a new book out on technical debt. Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> anybody really? uh, anybody up? seen that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so technical debt is one kind of measurement. Uh, is, uh, the talk yesterday morning, um, Dan Fox talking about baseball, had me thinking about um, you know he's measuring players, but you know are we measuring architecture? And you know he's talking about shifting the measurement to runs, hits, and outs, uh, or excuse me, outs outs and wins, right? And you know, what's the win for architecture and how do we measure whether we're contributing to the win? Um, wondering if anybody has any approaches that you've ever used for, for measuring. Well, may, maybe let me jump in here. Yeah. But I will go a little bit off chart here. So what, what I see, what's needed, what I would like to see happening yeah, is yeah. more like um, having something like uh, the process method, I don't really want to you know, distinguish here, you know, something that helps the developer in a continuous basis to get better. Okay. Yeah. That kind of like takes the focus away a little bit of making you know, architecture, architecture uh, evaluation explicit it's more the trend is kind of like make it implicit. Okay. So things like you know, that, you know, the developer team, so even if they don't do explicit architecture, you know, when they write the code, they actually are doing it. Mm -hmm. you know, implicit. And because we don't really put feedback loops in there, they most likely do it wrong. You know, didn't think about the consequences of things. Okay. Okay. So having something uh, that easily integrates, that gives them feedback on a continuous basis. Yeah, are we still on track? Yes or no, we need to make a correction. Yeah. Um, so reviews, yeah, design reviews, code reviews, conformance reviews. Um, things that is give very quick, uh, an hour or two, uh, some kind of like feedback that assures going in the right direction. Um, yeah. That is what I see as helping. Yeah. But it does mean yeah, that, you know, little by little, yeah, what I also think is happening is we will have a small group of what I really would consider to be architects. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not sure that these people, you know, they really understand, they have an instinct for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that they need methods or rigor. Yeah. Their brain works that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when it comes to, you know, when you look at all developers there and trying to make sure that everyone is doing the right thing, I don't think we can train them. I don't think we can give them methods you know, or processes that help them to get better. Mm -hmm. uh, only when we try to integrate that in their own development process, whatever that might be. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you're right. I, I think, think you're right. Yeah. And I'm, I think I'm speaking more to you know, when you, when you go through and create the architectures and you're working through those and then you, there is a point where you are starting to, to s transition those and educate the people who are going to be implementing against it. And I think that's probably the place where I'm thinking about that, yeah. that need for right. continuity and rigor. Okay. So I think you're right. right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, you know, one time I was talking to Mary Shaw, you know, the one who wrote that initial book yeah. here. And her picture was, and more and more I have to actually agree with her, you know, is 
that architecture or architectural practices need to get into the tool chain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. So especially when you go thinking in continuous integration to continuous yeah. de deployment. Mm. So if there is an architectural validation, uh, it, no, uh, if something's wrong with the architecture or something uh, did not comply to the architecture, mm, the tool chain has to bring it up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And pop yeah. up something here. Yeah. But this, but this, this yeah. is happening, you know, with continuous integration and doing perf continuous oh, yeah. performance yeah. testing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're able to. Yeah. So what are some yeah. of the things you're doing there? I mean, yeah. So when every time you merge something to your, your develop branch, you you do your performance tests and you okay. get and you get timings and you also at the same time you do your accuracy tests every night. You know, you have accuracy tests run to make sure your data pipeline is is producing mm -hmm. good results still because okay. you want to make sure you don't yeah. nothing yeah. crops in. I mean, right. we run static analysis up on check-in on everything, oh, gotcha. yeah. right? I mean, there's, there's, there's a sort of that's along kind of the a way. Given, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's, there's a sort of a given, but there's still a lot of organizations that don't do that. Okay. I mean, yep. when we buy software, which we also do a lot, right? I mean, yep. with, with contractors or, or consulting companies, uh, I won't hang any, but it, I'm surprised that not everybody is doing static analysis up on continuous hmm. integration. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, I have an organization that actually every team does it, but they ignore it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, you have to do something with it. They ignore the results. That's a whole other issue. For, for me, that, that, that connects a little bit to what you were saying. I mean, I, what I try to do with my development teams in the company is to try to make everybody an architect, right? Just this little bit, so that they're aware at least of, okay, I'm now making a decision. Mm -hmm. um, I, I give a copy of Michael's book as they're plugging yeah. books here to everybody. Like, okay. okay, you're actually contributing to the design by writing code. Yeah. All right, so Adam, you were just talking about data pipelines. Sounds mm -hmm. like you're working more in a, uh, an ML AI context, or is it? Yeah, that's yeah. right, yeah. And so is architecture different when you start thinking about IoT or ML or I mean, any of these um, new technologies? I mean, yeah, I mean, so, so for me in IoT, I, I, still, I still see coming back to the integration problem again. We have, okay. we have all these bits and pieces we want to stick together. Yep. Um, People, business people have an idea of, oh, this is just Legos, I'll just stick it together and it should work. Yeah. Um, and if devel developers haven't heard of these design mm -hmm. patterns, they just go and build one uh, yeah. you know, method that, that tries to do everything and, it, and it, it's hard to tease these, these different mm -hmm. steps out to make it maintainable. Mm. I think that, oh. oh, go ahead, please. No, I mean, the thing that scares me in, in AI is, um, there was a story that I, a banking executive in Sweden told at the conference I attended a couple of weeks ago and uh, she was going to their uh, Shanghai branch quite frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and the traffic in Shanghai is kind of crazy. And so on her most recent trip, the driver was very well behaved. And she asked why. Uh, I mean, why do you now drive mm -hmm. 79 kilometers an hour, <laughs> yeah. right? Not 89 or 85. And he's like, yeah, well, if I don't behave, my mortgage becomes more expensive, ah. right? There's this social yes. scoring. So, I mean, I think there are social implications of AI systems mm -hmm. and, and the bias that is in AI systems, mostly in their training sets. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we have the tools to deal with those ethical questions yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah Tracy? Yeah. I was gonna say that one of the things that I've experienced over the last 18 months is a lack of rigor around mm. the AI ML side okay. of the house. Um, yes. The same way that not to trash on database um, developers or database guys, um, but when you try to help them understand that things go into a repository and we check them in and check them out and we can audit against them, it's always been traditionally hard for me to get the, the database um, guys to do that same thing. They are the stewards of the data, therefore mm. they're stewards of their code, their schemas, everything else, and they kind of hoard those off to the side. Um, we're making so many strides there now, um, and getting kind of bringing that family together, but as we're bringing data science into the mix, there is not rigor around the models. There's not rigor around what's happening okay. there, uh, and that's where the whole data ops, at least a piece of the data ops um, uprising that seems right. to be happening is coming from, is that, is that lack of rigor on what I'm, how do I manage a model? Mm -hmm. Interesting. The, the other thing with IoT, I think, is um, usability. Oh. Um, I mean, so I mean, if you think about smart home applications, yep. you know, I, I don't want to have to be hacking my home automation system. If something beeps, I want to, I want to be able to understand yeah. what it is. And um, okay. this is something I think co companies need to start doing better. 
to, so to, usability. To, yeah, to drive yeah. these these I, these IoT applications into you know greater usage. Okay. So let me speak quickly about a, a bit of frustra frustration to many developers out there, including myself, because yes. I'm not savvy uh, in ML or AI, uh, uh -huh. and it, I would say yet, but I don't know if I'm, I'm going to have the, the time to get there. But uh, to my consolation, I saw a tweet by Grady Booch. I won't quote. I'm going to paraphrase. He was yeah. saying, "Hey." Everybody now is creating solutions using ML logic, uh, and, and there will, but the traditional components that we build that call ML logic, they will exist. Uh, and there will be an order of magnitude more traditional components than ML components. So mm. if you're not there yet, like me, uh, your job is safe for a long while. <laughs> According We're still to building him. Systems. So, We're still yes, building exactly. systems and solutions. And to, to the, point, the Lego piece earlier, right? We're still yeah. going to build components, and the fact that if we're thinking about some of the, the concepts over the last year, we've been talking for well, I guess two, three years about evolutionary architectures and yeah. API-led. All of those, all of those AI ML. If I'm talking about a model that's already been trained, right? I'm I'm plugging that in um, as an API into an ecosystem that I'm creating, mm -hmm. right? So. Yes, all of the things you already know, are, you, don't, you don't have to know the AI ML. Mm -hmm. Somebody else can do that, but the construct around it is going to be, you're still going to be absolutely relevant and still be doing yeah. it. You know, I'll trust you. Job. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the other thing is that ML needs training data, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this data doesn't typically or necessarily come from ML, ML systems. Right, no. Uh, it's the other thing. I mean, is it, for us, uh, the, the rate limiter in adopting machine learning because we just do not have enough data to train it on. Okay. Yes. And don't dress in yellow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so if a if a genie appeared in the room and granted you each one wish about software architecture, um, tool, method, uh, magical power, um, what would you ask for? Felix, you're smiling. Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what you asked for. And Paolo, yeah, may remember, you probably remember. Yeah. Something that we did also maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago. Remember Archie? Yeah. So for, for those who don't, don't know Archie, Archie was an, a system that we implemented. It's supposed to help an architect to make decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was actually pretty cool. Yeah, so it was able, you know, you can specify an architecture and you can specify what you want and the system says to you, well, you will have trouble here, you will have trouble here, that's cool, yeah, that's yeah. great and such. And it also gave you suggestions in terms of, well, if you want to solve that problem, here's the thing that you can do. And oh, by the way, should I do that for you? Yeah. And show you what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. So the nice piece of this was, it was really a wonderful training tool for students to think in terms of design yeah, and have an immediate feedback in terms yes. of what are the consequences of the decisions that I make when I put them in the architecture. Now, when we built that tool, you know, I kind of like compare that as if you would have taken a picture and would have a camera that had six by four pixels. You, know, you can imagine what kind of picture <laughs> you get there. You know? yep. So. After you know two or three iterations, the noise was so so big that you couldn't trust the result mm -hmm. anymore. You know? It was just not fine enough. Today, I would say, with all the technology that come come up there, you know, and especially you know thinking in terms of machine learning, you know, might be you know, a possibility. You know? There might be you know that we could revive you know, that that concept of a okay. design assistant. So the design assistant. You know? to help train you know, what IETEC actually is about. All right, and so let's just go down the line and we'll come back and end with Adam. Okay. Timon, the genie uh, walked in. Mm -hmm. I think a building code for software. Building uh, code, okay. Something that makes people liable for the decisions, just like an engineer, the bridge collapses, you're liable. Oh. Um, maybe not that extreme, right? But something that makes people really care about the important design decisions uh, and not run into the wall or crash the system. Okay. Think about the, the healthcare.gov, right, that you had mm -hmm. here, uh, the Obamacare lounge. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of stuff should just not be able to happen anymore, I think. Okay. Paul? I think I'm going to second Felix. 
<laughs> Probably it, it won't be Archie V2. It's going to be something like uh, AAAS, Architecture as a Service, ah, with machine okay. learning okay. and yeah. serverless yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. in a public cloud. So uh, something that we could ask to yes. the web, and, and the web would guide you to make uh, correct design decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's it. In some of the SEI books, we already have the decision trees that are there, and yes. we'll just the go tactics. tonight and build that model. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, we can do that. After happy hour. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, after happy yeah. hour. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's going to be um, fun then. I'm actually stumped on this one. Yeah? I, and I have no idea why, because normally I come up with something right yeah. away. I mean, World peace. So with people, right, I, if I, I, I would like there to be a better understanding of what architecture is. Um, I would, there's a, a broad continuum of types of architects. I'd like there to be a recognition of that. Okay. You know, that's kind of bland and mundane, but something that we need to have happen. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like there to be free compute for more people. Oh. Um, because I think that that would help with okay. just the time to play. I mean, there, when I get to a point where the free account is no longer a free account uh -huh. and I'm coming up with another um, email account so that I can get another free account, like, uh, okay, that's, that's a negative, right? That's a limiter, and I'd like to see you know, more, more of that availability. Okay. Um, I mean, there, there are lots of little things, yeah. but I don't, think I, have a, I don't think I have a great big wow for okay. you. Adam. So maybe to, to play off the idea of the building code, um, and maybe this is more of a, a, in the area of software engineering, but I just, I wish that we would focus more on kind of security and privacy from the beginning. Oh yeah. This isn't really one of my personal areas that I'm, that I'm an expert in, but I just mm -hmm. feel like if we don't start attending to these things, mm -hmm. they're really gonna come back to bite us. We have more and more smart devices, yeah. um, and I, I feel like these, it's really gonna yes. hurt us. I heard if, a if joke the other this. day, uh, IOT, the S is for security. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're more to get your right go up on your street on the highway. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yes, and yeah, we saw Phil Koopman's talk, and there's plenty to scare us here, yeah. uh, but also lots of inspiration. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left. Um, any questions from the audience for the panel? No? I think everybody's thinking about that happy hour you just spent. Yeah. 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 Sounds like it. All right. Well, thank you all for this. Uh, this was interesting, uh, an exciting experiment, and thanks for being brave and appearing <laughs> on live TV. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.